Hello everyone, my name is Ira Fay, and it has been quite some time since I recorded a video. Things have been busy with work, but I am happy to be able to share this game with you. This is a game that I played a couple weeks ago, and I am playing as Shadow. My opponent is free, and we've given free two action tokens, which I feel like balances the base game a bit better. So one of them is a, a muster action that you can use for the political track, and the other is draw a card. So let's get started. I think that I so I allocated one eye, and then I got this great roll, which is just beautiful. Plenty of musters. I drew cards that are fine. I'm happy to see many kings because it lets me muster the south rounds early and get a good force there. Also, great host is a great combat effect. And Worm Tongue, I don't usually play because activating Rohan isn't that big of a deal because they still need three musters, but it is, you know, an option and should be easy to cycle with the Witch King later if I want to. So I've been thinking more about the importance of turn one of the game, and sometimes the actions are quite um, obvious. You don't have a lot of choices, but with a rule like this, the free people really have quite a few options. And so looking at this draw, King Brand's men, one will of the West, what what would you do? There, th This is a really tricky situation just from the very beginning. Um, we can see that it's, it's, I would think, quite likely that the shadow will use one muster to bring Isengard to war, one muster to bring out Saruman. That feels pretty straightforward, but then they have two, three more dice, and clearly free people almost certainly will use one action with this Will of the West to move once, but then what do you do with these three musters? And also remember, you have a free muster with the action die. Uh, sorry, with the action token. So this is actually four, four musters. You can get the elves to war and on top of that, get an extra Elven Elite in somewhere. Or you could get the North quite close to war. Or you could use these army musters to get our, you know, these units from Edoras into Westamnet and maybe Iron Hills into Erebor. So there are a bunch of choices. Um, think now what you would do as free. They started off by passing, which I think is smart if you're not really sure where Shadow is going to attack yet. And then as Shadow, I mustered. Uh, Isengard, and then free people moved. They were safe. That's pretty makes sense. And then I got Saruman. You need to be a little careful about getting Saruman in the middle of turn one if the free people still have a will of the West in movement, so that potentially if Gandalf dies, they could get Gandalf round one. But there's no chance of that happening here, so it's safe to get Saruman right now. Okay, and now to me, this is where sort of the real actions we took. We took our sort of gimme actions and now what are we going to do with these last three dice i'm not sure what i would do here as um as free i think playing king's brand men it's usually good to cycle if you cycle into a scouts then you can get a northern regular into old forest road i feel like that's a pretty that's a pretty good start so i think i'd probably do that the one thing that it precludes is that then I'm not going to be able to get the elves to war that quickly if Shadow comes in. And so, um, yeah. And and maybe that, possibly that would have been an option as Shadow. It, instead of getting Isengard to war, I could have gotten Sauron to war and then move very quickly to bring the elves to war also. But with all these musters, I'd rather not. As a shadow, at least, I'd rather let shadow. I'd rather let the free people have to spend their musters getting their um, factions to war, as opposed to just mustering them to war myself by attacking. Okay, so uh, King Brand, King's Brand men, I, King Brand's men. I think that makes sense. And then draw a card. It's Kirden's ships. Obviously, that's nice to see, and it's going to encourage me to, as free people, to get the elves to war. And as Shadow, I, I always want to get Sauron and um, Saruman to war, or Isengard to war as soon as possible. Um, 
particularly in the in the base game in, in Lords of Middle Earth, maybe there's a little bit of attention there, but but for for this, it's totally fine. And with these two army movements, I'm now thinking, you know what, I can go, I can go north, and so to be able to go north, I need Sauron to be at war. So muster them to war. Okay. Um, free people get the elves one towards war. I think that makes sense. I use my army movement to get people get get this army from Dol Guldur into Eastern Mirkwood, and I get my Southron and Easterling armies moving with the anticipation of either coming to West Rondor or Umbar, but I know that I have a muster for them to put two units there, and then two 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 units in near Harad, and then two units in South Rune, and then two units in North Rune. So that will that will be very nice with many kings. Okay, and then seeing this attack coming north free people musters the elves once again and i'm reasonably happy with that as shadow they're going to get to have one more muster before i arrive but i can probably still take out a um, one regular two elite force particularly if i bring in my reinforcements from um, the south rons and easterlings so I don't know, maybe it would make more sense to have two units or even one unit from Dale into Old Forest Road just to slow down this army movement. It costs me an army movement and it gives a muster to the north. Maybe something to think about. And then there's still some slight chance I wouldn't manage to I wouldn't manage to defeat it. Okay, so I am happy a shadow to move into Old Forest Road and um, at this point, I move my units to Gorgoroth from Baradur just to get that ready too. It seems like I can make a decent attack against Gondor. I can make a decent attack up north, easily getting three victory points, maybe even getting five victory points up north. We'll see how it goes. Okay, and now we confirm that for the action token rules, which I had actually previously been playing wrong, you can take, you can use an action token even if you don't have any dice left. So the round only ends when both players pass in a row. So, um, but my opponent, um, oh, so we do a little take back just to confirm, but then, but then we're like, yeah, you can do it even without. And then they decide, um, I don't remember if they do or don't. I think they do. Yeah. So they go ahead and get the elves all the way to war, which that's going to let me get the witch king next round. But it also lets them muster an elite into woodland realm before this army comes in. So I think that's a great use of an action token. And that's just a great example of how the action tokens help balance the game. It's just a little bit stronger defense for for shadow. I mean, for for um, for the free people, maybe they're still going to hold woodland realm. Maybe I'm still going to uh, take it, but at least it's just a little more balanced. OK, so we go to next round. I'm up to eight dice. And then I roll a whole bunch of musters, which is great to see early game. This is a very good roll for me. And my opponent gets one, um, uh, sorry, a, b a balanced roll, but no but no Will of the West. So he's not going to get Gandalf this round, even if Gandalf manages to perish. Okay, so first action, clearly going to muster um, into Woodland Realm. And then clearly I'm going to put Woodland Realm under siege so he can't muster in there anymore. Okay, in terms of cards drawn, I did get Day Without Dawn, and that's particularly nice in combination with these musters because it means that I can um, I can have this card active. I need to have all Shadow Nations at war to be able to play this card. And since Gandalf is still in the Fellowship, there's a chance that maybe next turn he'll get a character die and a Will of the West, and he might lose Gandalf early in the turn while he still has a will of the West thinking he's going to get to bring Gandalf the white in and I'll be able to get rid of it with day without dawn. So this is a, this is a great card to get early in combination with the, um, the musters to bring the South Rons and Easterlings to war. Another great card. I'm just noticing, uh, I drew Palantir of Orthanc. This is going to work out really well because he doesn't have any will of the Wests right now. And on top of that, he, um, is going to feel some pressure to use a Will of the West to get Gandalf if if he loses Gandalf, and presumably he's going to try and lose Gandalf pretty soon. So he has a lot of pressure on his Wills of the West right now, and I'm om I'm, I'm likely to get a ring from the Palantir. So I'm, I'm happy to trade a die 
of mine in exchange for a die and a ring from him. That's that's a great that's a great trade. Okay, so um, we I guess we're talking about strategy a little bit. I go he passes I or they pass and I um, bring a uh, the Southrons and Easterlings to war. They they pass again and then. Um, I bring in the Witch King because uh, I want to start to attack uh, Woodland Realm. I do think maybe I want to wait one more die. If I'm not prepared to attack next action, then it's nice to delay this because it does turn on a single card, which is the Red Arrow. So the Red Arrow is only playable if Gondor is active. And when I bring in the Witch King, it activates uh, Gondor. So if I'm ready to attack next action, great, good, good to bring in Witch King. If I'm not ready to attack next action, maybe better to wait on it. Okay, I think at the moment I brought him in, maybe it was a very minor mistake. Obviously, it's moot if he doesn't have Red Arrow, but you know, something to think about. He has drawn three strategy cards. Okay, he goes ahead, and, or they, sorry, go ahead and move, and um, I miss. That's reasonable. I'm only rolling one die. And I play many kings to the service of Mordor. So I think this is an example of I just should have reversed the order. There, there's no reason why I, I should have brought in the witch king there. If I'm gonna if I know that I'm gonna play many kings, and it's obvious he was gonna move. It's not like there were any major surprises there. Just just play many kings. I don't know. May, maybe by delaying many kings, I'm hiding some information from my opponent. But I'd I'd rather disable the use of. Red Arrow, particularly at this moment where they have two units in Edoras, it would be great to be able to play Red Arrow, get a good um, muster for Rohan, get some uh, leader and elite here, and then with um, an a army movement next round, be able to bring them into Western Men. I will say one other thing. At the beginning of this round, I had a whole bunch of musters, and I could have considered mustering a bunch in Orthanc and then crashing into crashing into um, Helm's Deep. And that's a, that, that was a real possibility. The reason why I went for getting the Southrons and Easterlings to war is that I wanted to try and deal with the North while I'm doing battle up here. And I had Day Without Dawn, so I knew that this was going to be, and, and many kings to the service of Mordor, so I knew that there were going to be some real benefits of getting the Southrons and Easterlings to war. And that's why... That's why I took that route. If I didn't have those cards, then maybe I would have prioritized getting into Helm's Deep early. That is a possibility, particularly if Gandalf hasn't showed up. My opponent might not even be able to kill off Gandalf the Grey, might not be able to get Gandalf the White. So I could be safe from, from Ents, at least for a little bit. Okay, but I go ahead and play Many Kings. I think this is a good route. And now this army is completely full in near Harad. And this South Rune plus North Rune is a nice stack of 10. So if you get many kings to the service of Mordor, you can put two in the south and get a full stack. And then you can also put two in uh, North Rune and South Rune and get a full stack that way. And that, by the way, is in, in round one when I did when I had a half army movement. I moved from Baradur into Gorgoroth instead of getting the South Rune army moving because I knew I had already drawn many kings to the service of Mordor at that time. I knew I wanted to put two here, two in South Rune and two in North Rune to make ten. And if I had already moved these units to East Rune, then I I would have just had not a great place for two extra units. So that's why I did all that. Um, and the game, these decisions can can really matter even just from from turn one an extra half movement on turn one okay so i play my card and the fellowship moves again this time i hit them on a five still you know kind of kind of good luck for me um and i draw one obviously a pleasant tile that was the third movement so they would have been revealed into moria if i got a reveal but odds of getting revealed there with only a single die on a five were, were quite low so i think this is a, a fair outcome and then my opponent decides should I lose Gandalf here? Should I just take a corruption? What should I do? Now, with these cards in hand, with how fast the Fellowship is moving, given that corruption seems relatively low and my opponent is, uh, at least, you know, Shadow is moving relatively fast militarily, I would be inclined here 
to lose Gandalf, I think. What what would you do? Think about that for a second. Would you lose Gandalf here to a one? Obviously, less corruption that you want. You don't have a Will of the West right here. So my opponent chose to lose Gandalf. And I, you know, I think that's a great choice. It it gives you Strider as guide, so you're going to be able to move more quickly with the fellowship. It gives you a good chance of getting a Will of the West next round and and, and getting your fifth die from Gandalf the White. And most importantly, because I see that my opponent has all three nations at war, if they have Day Without Dawn, then they could play Day Without Dawn to cancel my Will of the West unless I take the first action with the Will of the West. So I think with the, and it so happened, I did actually have Day Without Dawn. And so if my opponent was hoping to move again next round, lose Gandalf to a bigger value, and then bring him back with Gandalf the White in the same round, that just would not work because I have Day Without Dawn. So I think this is a great choice. And the, the Day Without Dawn, all, four shadow, all three shadow nations being at war, that really tips it over. Okay, so Gandalf dies to a one, and I get my armies moving into East Rune. This stack is now ready to go. My opponent gets this regular from Iron Hills into Erebor, which I think is great. It makes Erebor much harder to take over, and then makes the key move getting these units into Westamnet so that uh, they're able to, from Edoras to Westamnet, so they'll, they'll be able to move into Helm's Deep. And my opponent does have scouts. So if I tried to attack into Fords of Eisen, they can retreat into Helm's Deep and then do an army movement into, into Helm's Deep from Westamnet on the next action. Or if they're hard pressed and they don't have a, an army action and they only have extra character dice, let's say they happen to roll a whole bunch of character dice, then you can use scouts to retreat from Fords of Eisen into Westamnet. And now that that uh, army in Westamnet has a leader from the Fords of Eisen, then you can use a character action to move the army from Westamnet into Helm's Deep. So either way, with scouts and um, this army in Westamnet, my opponent now is, you know, has very good chances of of getting a, a full defense of Helm's Deep. I don't know that they have scouts yet, but you know, they they've started to draw cards. If I get Swarm of Bats, I might save it for an attack on Fords of Eisen. Okay, so I go ahead and play Palantir as the last action because it means my opponent is going to have a lot of pressure next round with their Will of the West. If they don't roll any Will of the West, obviously they'll be sad to not get Gandalf. If they roll one Will of the West, they're going to have a tough choice between getting Gandalf right away or clearing my... Uh, Palantir, Pro probably they'll just get Gandalf right away for fear of um, Day Without Dawn. And then I'm going to get to use my first action to play a card. So that's um, that's a good, this is just a good situation for me. Okay, so my opponent draws Riders of Theoden. Obviously slightly late would be better to get them into Edoras before they move, but still good to see it. And Riders of Theoden is good. Obviously slightly late on Wizard Staff, but, you know, if you roll a Will of the West right now, you're probably going to be pretty happy that Gandalf is not in the Fellowship because you'll get your fifth die. All right, I draw Dreadful Spells and Return of the Witch King. Swarm of Bats, this is a useful combat effect to go into Fords of Eisen if I want to. And um, my opponent, uh, sorry, I allocate one eye and another... Good roll. One Palantir for use with the Palantir of Orthanc. Okay. And my opponent does have no character movement. So this this often happens um, on a turn when you know your opponent is about to bring in Gandalf. That's particularly a turn where you don't want to allocate many eyes because they're probably going to be using at least one of their dice if they roll a Will of the West, not to move, but to get Gandalf. So I'm happy to have had a low number of eyes rolled and even more musters here. I'm, I'm fine. I'm thinking about mustering up Orthanc at this point. Could be good. Okay. So a wizard is never late, the nor is he early. He arrives so precisely when he means to. But this is exactly the scenario we were talking about with um, having lost Gandalf to the one. This is exactly why you'd want to do it. And it paid off well for my opponent. So that was a great play by them. Okay. 
and um, I play de dreadful spells here. Obviously, this is really sad. This is only two Nazgul against um, Woodland Realm, but I really wanted to play a card because I had Palantir of Orthanc, and I get a free card draw out of it. So maybe it's a mistake. You know, this is two two thirds of a hit might might inflict one damage. Um, maybe it's just a waste. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it would have been better to attack into Woodland Realm once, cycle a card with Worm Tongue, and then see what I draw. But then my opponent would be able to get rid of the Palantir that way. I don't know. M maybe this is a mistake. It's not. It's not entirely clear to me. But okay, so I attack. I attack Woodland Realm with Dreadful Spells. I don't get any hits, which is you know reasonable. Uh, and uh, then I draw Rage of the Dunling. So I just changed a um, character card into a strategy card, which I can do with Palantir of Orthanc. And I did that because um, I wanted to, I think, just get, I have so many musters here. I wanted to get potentially useful mustering cards. And there tend to be more powerful, a little more powerful combat effects with the strategy cards. And I also thought, you know, I'm probably gonna need some reinforcements, either the one that lets me put a warg up there or an orc or upgrade the, the orcs into bigger orcs. So I guess those are trolls, the elites are trolls. Okay, anyway, so I did that and I don't know, maybe, maybe a mistake. My opponent passes and I think that's a good play here. I don't have any more Palantirs so there's no risk of me drawing more cards from the Palantir of Orthanc, so they can wait to give me a ring, even if they're going to get rid of it this turn. Okay, I go ahead and muster more Nazgul. I know that I want to get more Nazgul, more Nazgul leadership into this battle, and I know that I want to at least, you know, be able to hunt the Fellowship a little bit as they get past Moria, just to start to slow them down, harass them a little bit. Um, another consideration might have been to just muster up Orthanc, Maybe I should have done that. I don't know. I get even more Nazgul, and then um, my opponent passes again here, and I move armies. What am I doing? Okay, so I move into, I threaten uh, Erebor, and I get this army ready to go. I'm not exactly sure why I did that upon reflection. I don't know. Why aren't I just using a character die to move Nazgul. I think what I was thinking was, this army isn't that big. I better get my reinforcements closer so that if I do make an attack here, um, this army is ready to reinforce the Witch King because I, I don't want the Witch King to get routed if, I, you know, if they do three hits against me or something like that. Um, I don't want to mess with that. So I don't know. M maybe that's wrong. Maybe that's right. Okay, my opponent musters Gondor one towards war. That seems fine. I guess there was some partial threat of getting into Dol Amroth too quickly. I'm I'm not exactly sure everything I was thinking there. And then I attack Erebor. Why did I put Erebor under siege here? Am I su switching to Erebor? I guess I guess my plan is Put Erebor under siege. Then once Erebor and Woodland Realm is under siege, then I can attack into Dale, and these extra units won't have anywhere useful to go. Because if I attack Dale right away, they'll probably be able to retreat into Erebor. I guess that's what my thinking is. Um, seems okay. I'm not sure why I do that here as opposed to figuring out what I'm doing with this extra muster. Okay, I attack into Erebor. My opponent plays Riders of Theoden. I think that's a great play. And then this army muster, they're going to be able to move them into Westonnet, so they're really going to be able to defend uh, Helm's Deep. That's great. And then I use the voice of Saruman to get three regulars. And I think in that case, you know, often you'll end up upgrading the regulars into elites, which is good. But uh, I have Rage of the Dunlandings, which lets me pull two units from north, two units from south Dunland, plus get two more, um, and that can make a pretty powerful attack. I can sneak attack into Lorien. I could sneak attack into Rivendell pretty easily. I'm definitely thinking about Rivendell here just because the Fellowship is still there, 
And so I could potentially get into get into Rivendell pretty quickly if my opponent doesn't uh, roll a bunch of musters. Okay, they use an army movement to get the to get Theoden into Westhamnet, which I think is great. And then they pull their regular back uh, and a leader back from Helm's Deep, um, or from Fords of Eisen into Helm's Deep, which I like actually, um, because if I had Swarm of Bats, which I do, then I could potentially eliminate uh, an extra leader and, uh, from Fords of Eisen. So this way they're going to be able to get a full contingent, two leadership, two elites, three regulars into Helm's Deep, plus they'll have this regular guarding Fords of Eisen. This is a great, great defense of Helm's Deep. I might still be able to take it, but my opponent is investing a lot of dice in it and it's going to make it hard. So, okay. I feel like in terms of shadow, the fellowship's moving slowly enough. I, I should, particularly if I get a few extra musters or I get some powerful combat cards, I should be able to take out the North relatively easily. Um, you know, maybe not super easily. These regulars in Dale could cause some trouble, but I should be able to make some progress in the North and then maybe Gondor and then maybe a sneak attack at Rivendell. That's, that's sort of where I'm thinking in terms of points, maybe three, three points down here in Gondor, maybe three or five points up here in the North, and then maybe two from an Alvin stronghold, or maybe I come down and go for, for Helm's Deep if I get the appropriate cards. Rage of the Dunlendings gives me a lot of flexibility right now. Okay, so um, I attack Woodland Realm, I play Wormtongue, and it looks like I get one, uh, one hit. Sorry about that, one second. One second, I'll be right back. Okay, so we have the card played and looks like one one hit, otherwise pretty friendly. And I don't press just because I don't have very many units there. Um, okay, Foul Thing from the Deep, I'm happy to see, um, particularly in combination with Warm Osvar and Toil. So I'm, I'm definitely drawing good cards here. And my opponent obviously gets rid of Wizard Staff. They do have, they had Dun Dead Men of Dunharrow. Um, and now they have um, Gua here. So they can get a Strider into Westamnet. Then they can play Dunman of Dunharrow to get a bunch of units into Pilar Gear. And then they can potentially crown Aragorn. So that's a, that's a possibility for them, something to be thinking about. All right, I roll the this time, and my opponent gets... A whole bunch of Palantirs. So this is interesting. I'll, I'll be curious to see what they end up doing with their Palantirs, but if you happen to roll a whole bunch of Palantirs and you have cards like this, maybe it's a good time to separate um, Strider. It's a little risky because you don't have um, a Will of the West right now, and so maybe you're going to end up not rolling one, but um, I think you have some chances there. Okay, let's see what they do. Um, interesting. So they say they don't have cards to play. They use a Palantir to get rid of my Palantir, which I think is certainly correct since I have two Palantirs to play. Um, and then I start off with Worn with Sorrow and Toil. They play Grimbjorn. Yeah, I mean, I think it's nice to muster to get the North going. It's going to be a formidable army there. Um, I don't know though. Maybe I, I feel like I'm, I probably would have gone with the, um, the plan to get Aragorn, bring him down. I mean, three regulars in Pilar gear is a non-trivial, non-trivial force. Um, you could use these. I don't know exactly what I would do with these army musters. Maybe I would start mustering Gondor, just get Gondor to war with one, and then muster again in Dol Amroth or Minas Tirith. 
I don't know. I don't know exactly what I would do, but I like Gua here and oh yeah, and particularly with scouts. So so this this army with Aragorn, it's not it's not even gonna or with Strider, it's not even gonna take a bunch of hits. It's just gonna use scouts to retreat to Lamadon or something like that. Your last action could be dead men. Yeah, so I think I think that's probably what I would have done. Especially with so many eyes, you're not even you don't even feel that bad about not moving. I mean, it's always good to move at least once, but it's a good time. This, this is a good chance to to get to move out with um, Strider. Oh, and on top of all that, we also have Warren with Sauron Toil. So by bringing Strider out of the Fellowship, you're reducing the impact of Warren with Sauron Toil. So I guess for oh, and Keratin's ships. Holy cow! Yeah. So yeah. So I I definitely with all of those things. I would have definitely used uh, Gua here to bring Strider seven moves, one to Trollshaws, two to Holland, three to North Downs, four to South Downs, five to Gap of Rohan, six to Fords of Eisen, seven to Helm's Deep or West of Net. And then, you know, Dead Men of Dunharrow to Pilar Gear, have the scouts in hand, have the... Kyrdan's ships in hand like that's going to be a pain in the neck to take Dol Amroth <laughs> that was just like nope Shadow is never getting those two victory points um, okay so be it all right so as Shadow I I don't know any of that was a possibility I'm pleased that didn't happen and uh, I muster in Orthanc and then my opponent draws a card yeah. I guess so. Um, interesting to draw a strategy card. I don't know exactly what you're going for. Okay, new. I um, play New Powers Rising. Holy cow, I drew New Powers Rising. I don't remember when I drew that, but... Man, I've been drawing a bunch of good cards. Okay, so New Powers Rising, obviously super good. Uh, get tons of mustering. And I have a single elite and a single regular left in the Isengard pool. Okay. And then my opponent gets uh, Helm's Deep ready. That's good. Uh, you know, this this unit moving from North Downs into uh, Bree is okay. I like it slightly more to Etten Moors because then you're only two more movements away from Rivendell. And um, it also threatens a little bit of military attack against Angmar. I mean, who who really cares? But it's some, some possibility. Um, this way, by moving to Bree, you're one, two, three away from Rivendell. So Etten Moors is a slightly better location for that. Also, if Shadow ever plays Monsters Roused, um, having the Elite in Etten Moors will block a single regular from showing up in Etten Moors. And then if you get that regular into Trollshaws, it, it blocks, I think, the Elite that shows up in Trollshaws. So um, even if you never end up moving them in, they can sort of deter an attack on Rivendell. Um, Oh, and my dreams of a sneak attack, my dreams of a sneak attack into uh, Rivendell with Rage of the Dunlings just couldn't quite pan out yet. Um, I want to, but I'm not quite ready for it. All right, I attack Woodland Realm. I didn't, I think I didn't roll any character dice that round. And so I, I'm attacking with only three leadership, which obviously is um, not so great, but I am. My opponent played... Um, scouts and uh fords of eisen is now it doesn't really matter if i play scouts there anymore i mean play swarm of bats there so i i played the swarm of bats here um maybe it would have been better to use the relentless assault no obviously can't use relentless assault that doesn't make sense i want to hang on to foul thing in case he gets revealed at some point then i can hit him twice with worn with sorrow and toil so um all right this is a friendly battle. We do one each. And um, I get Desperate Battle, which is a great combat effect. Uh, my opponent musters the north towards war. And then I attack Woodland Realm yet again. I'm just trying to whittle them down. I'm hoping that this is going to do it. 
yeah. All right, so I play Desperate Battle. My opponent plays Sudden Strike. They get um, they miss with Sudden Strike. I get enough hits to be able to take out Woodland Realm, and uh, my opponent gets two hits back. So, you know, this is not great against a, a mounting Northern Army, but enough. And I got it before they drew Thranduil's Archers, and it took me quite a few dice, but... Um, I, I don't know exactly how lucky it was. I think it was, you know, probably rel relatively fair. I did spend quite a few dice on it. Okay, I'm happy to see Great Host. Uh, Flocks of Corbain, I don't really care about much. Um, they could maybe help them, help reveal them over um, through Moria, but I don't feel too too strongly about that. Okay, um, Fighting Arc High is great in combination with Rage of the Dunlandings. I can really go after the Fellowship in Rivendell with the right cards. So I'm, I'm happy, very happy with the cards I'm drawing. Um, all right, allocate only one eye, roll more, but still no character dice. So I am feeling a little stuck with all these Nazgul down here. Maybe I should have moved them when I had the chance. Um, my opponent, still no Will of the West. So... You know, had you done that whole plan of getting Aragorn or Strider out of the Fellowship and down into Dol Amroth or Pelargir or something, then maybe you feel bad about having done that without rolling Will of the West. But you know your chances are pretty good, so you have to you sort of have to take your chances, I think. And um, that would have been a really good turn to to use those dice. And then, honestly, if Gondor is at war. You can muster up Gondor like crazy and put up a really solid defense down here. Okay, with this situation, it's not quite as clear where uh, free people should be mustering. So, okay, I start by attacking into Fords of Eyes in here. Um, not exactly sure what I'm thinking with this ordering. I guess I'm like, I have Rage of the Dunlandings and I don't have leadership, so I'm just going to take out Helm's Deep while I can. I do have Fighting Urukai, so, you know. Okay, so I attack and miss that unit, which is a little bit bothersome. And I leave two elites behind so that if um, free people would need two Ents, two Ent cards to be able to have any chance of taking out Saruman. Um, maybe this could have been played slightly differently. I then do a regular army movement separating these armies. I guess I'm thinking this army is going to go up to, I, I don't know. I honestly don't know what's happening with that. Why didn't I just leave those units in North Dunland? Um, why didn't I start moving these units out of, Mordor to start to threaten Gondor? I, I don't know. I really don't know what I was thinking there. Maybe I'm going to muster up more and then go after Lorien? Don't know. Okay, so I think that was probably a mistake. I don't really know what I was thinking there. Would have been better to get the units going in Mordor. Okay, Fellowship moves once and is safe. That seems very fair. I muster an elite into Orthanc in anticipation of doing a swip swap where I move these regulars into, into Orthanc and these elites into Fords of Eisen because I don't have leadership right now and I want to be able to make attacks without uh, having to spend a ring to move Nazgul around. So I think that's what I'm thinking here. My opponent starts mustering the north, which... I mean, you have a bunch of musters, and you can certainly cause a lot of trouble up there. I think it's fine to force the issue up there. That, that seems fine. Um, at this point, I'm using a ring. I'm moving Nazgul all around. I'm not sure why I'm doing this in this order. I guess... Okay, so... Hmm. I think why I did that, if I'm remembering correctly, is... I anticipate that my opponent is going to put the North to war with their next action. At that moment, I want to be prepared to attack Dale so that my opponent cannot muster more in Dale. Maybe they'll muster more in Karak, but Karak's farther away. 
and it will let me sort of take over Dale. I would prefer to save that ring until the fellowship is revealed so that I can put a Nazgul on the fellowship, but I'm going to be attacking down here in Helm's Deep. I'm going to be attacking uh, Dale if my opponent gets the North to war, and I want to maximize my chances of taking out as many of those units in Dale as possible. Okay, so I think that's what I was thinking, and I guess that timing was right to not wait any longer because my opponent does indeed get the north to war, and then I do indeed attack the north. So um, I play a strategy card here. I think well, I think it's going to be, yeah, I play Great Host because I want to try and kill these guys off, and I have a chance of getting two hits, two sixes on ten dice, you know, some chance, and so this Great Host will be a third hit and will also take out that leader. That would be nice. It'll... It'll make it much harder for my opponent to um, be strong in this area. I'm a little worried about a northern attack to take over a Dole Golder. And so now I guess I'm feeling a little better about having um, a stronger force in Moria. Okay. Um, so I roll enough hits. My opponent gets two hits back. I leave one unit on Erebor, but otherwise bring a large amount uh, a large army into Dale because I want to be prepared to reinforce Woodland Realm. My opponent can get three elites and a regular here by the end of this turn. It would not be hard for them to start to come back towards Woodland Realm. I want to be prepared for that. Erebor can sit for a while. I'm going after Helm's Deep. If I can just hold on to three victory points up north, I can get three victory points down south. Prob maybe Minas Tirith also. So maybe five victory points in Gondor and then um, Helm's Deep, that would be 10 victory points. Maybe I end up going back up to Erebor instead of Minas Tirith. So I'm keeping, I'm keeping my options open. Okay. So, um, my opponent starts recruiting up in Karak. I think that makes sense. It's definitely going to cause some trouble up there. It gives you options for military victories. I wonder maybe, maybe get Gondor to war. I mean, if you get Gondor to war, I guess you're holding Cirdan ships. So you're just holding Cirdan ships if, if um, Dol Amroth ever gets besieged. But it's still nice to have something to do with those musters. And these units in Carrick, they're just far away. It's just hard to get them to, to do useful things. I think I might. I don't know. It's it's not it's not exactly clear to me. If I could muster in Dale, I'd be very excited to muster in Dale. But mustering Carrick is a little less exciting. Okay, I do my army movement and shuffle around. I now have a nearly full stack in Fords of Eisen. I'm feeling, you know, pretty good about my chances against Helm's Deep with um, with fighting Uruk High and combat cards to play, given the number of elites I have. All right, so my opponent continues mustering up in Karak, and then I put Helm's Deep under siege. Rohan is not quite at war yet. I'm going to want to take over Rohan pretty quickly so that um, you know, they don't, they don't, uh, muster up too much, but I still have Rage of the Dunlandings, so I have some options in terms of, um, you know, meeting up in Holland I could potentially do with these armies. I don't know. We'll see. I'm actually quite short on regular units, so I'm going to need to lose some regular units or lose some elite units, muster them up more in Orthanc, and then I'll be able to make better use of Rage of Dunlandings. Okay, um, this is an interesting moment of discard. Do you, as Shadow, what do you discard here? I have Threats and Promises, obviously useful combat card. Is there's Bane, Foul Thing from the Deep, Fighting Uruk High, Rage of the Dunlandings, Flocks of Crabane, and Day Without Dawn. Um, I guess Flocks of Crabane, that's not that hard of a discard. Um, these are good tile drawing cards if he ever gets, if they ever, if the Fellowship ever gets revealed. Allocate one eye. Roll two, and my opponent gets a great roll, very flexible. And they start by um, mustering. So that's, I'm really, I'm a little surprised by that. Um, it does keep your options open for a military victory. Um, you definitely want to use a Will of the West to be safe from Day Without Dawn. Um, but 
is that really the priority to muster more in Karak? I feel like the priority would be to play Vile. I could play Vile of Galadriel. And then I could move. And I wouldn't be too up. I mean, Bilbo Song, I, don't, I wouldn't want to move. I, I mean, I wouldn't want to lose that to Worn with Sorrow and Toil. But I guess the Fellowship is really looking fine right now. How bad would it be to move twice through Moria? I guess my I'm th I'm guessing my opponent's plan is just to move once and then declare in Lorien. If I were the Fellowship, I think I, I wouldn't have spent that on a muster. I've had plenty of musters this game. I would want to play Vile of Gladrill, probably. Okay. Um, all right, I play Fighting Archai. Let's see how the combat goes. I start with Devilry of Orthanc. I redraw... Um, what do I do? I forget. Oh, what do I draw? I draw Pits of Mordor, which is which is a great card for military defense because I am a little worried, not like super worried, but I am a little worried about these units coming down to Dol Golder or these units coming up to Mount Gundabad. So having Pits of Mordor, while it's a great combat effect, it's also a good um, a good defense against military victory. It doesn't seem like my opponent's really going that route, but could be. Okay, so a few hits. I play Isildur's Bane. I don't, I don't um, love spending that card um, for combat effect because I like drawing extra tiles. But the Fellowship's not revealed. It doesn't seem like my opponent is rushing to move the Fellowship. So, okay. Um. I also am thinking maybe my opponent's going to try and get Strider, in, I mean, get Aragorn, in which case, like, if they have We Prove the Swift, Swift or, or um, Gua here, they could use a character die to separate Strider, thinking that they're going to get Crown Aragorn with the Will of the West. And so at that point, I'll play Day Without Dawn. So I'm waiting. I, the threat of Day Without Dawn is more than sometimes actually playing Day Without Dawn. So, sometimes you just want to play it and get rid of the Will of the West. But I'm I'm saving this. I'm trying to tempt my opponent into separating Strider. Okay. Anyway, back to the combat. I play Cruel as Death and um, do some damage and then two more hits. And so I, I don't know exactly what was supposed to happen in this combat. It was, it was a pretty pretty damaging battle on both sides um my opponent is left with two regulars um you know hopefully i should still be able to take that out but it's a little uh problematic if um if rohan starts mustering up a bunch so let's see what my opponent does my opponent moves here and um Oh, I think at that moment I didn't have any regulars in the force pool. And so I wanted to muster once uh, upgrading those elites into uh, upgrading those regulars into elites, getting me more um, regulars in the force pool for Isengard. So that's why I did that muster right there. And my opponent plays File of Galadriel. They're happy being at five movement, I guess. They're going to declare in Lorien. That muster, I don't know. Did I really need to muster in Dol Guldur? I guess my thinking is my opponent could do an army movement to Old Forest Road. They could use this Will of the West to do another army movement into Narrows of the Forest. And then at the start of next round, they could immediately move into Dol Guldur without it being um, with nobody in there. And so I wanted to at least prevent that. So I guess that's what I was thinking by doing a muster there. Because this is a sizable force. I think in combination with, and I want to use these two dice to do more attacks. So in combination with the size of this force and sort of the turn structure, I think it was worth, it was probably worth doing that. I do have Pits of Mordor. So my plan is, okay, I'm not going to muster more in Dol Guldur, but at least this way they can move into Dol Guldur. I can maybe get one more muster if they're really committing to it before they arrive. And then I can do another um, two more units with Pits of Mordor. So I'm probably, probably okay for military defense there. Okay, so they muster a regular in Carrick and a regular in 
Eteris, I think that makes sense. You know, muster the places why, why you have the chance. And I attack into Helm's Deep, and I get no hits, and my opponent gets two. So, you know, that's not great. I know that I'm now going to have to reinforce from Rohan, I mean from Isengard, and um, Helm's Deep is having a good defense. So, you know, I think, I think that's just an example of setting yourself up for possible success. My opponent invested quite a few dice into Rohan in advance of this siege. I also did. I had a big army, but sometimes the battles aren't going to go exactly your way. And um, this is a, this is exactly what can happen in Rohan. Um, so this is great. If my opponent keeps mustering up in Rohan, maybe they get some end cards. Like it's even possible to take out the Witch King. So I'm definitely not. Um, I'm def definitely being cautious with my attacks, and I'm going to try and reinforce that um, army as soon as possible in Helm's Deep. All right. So my opponent gets Red Arrow there. I get um, Half Orcs and Goblin Men, which I'm happy to see. That's good for military defense. It's also good for reinforcing these sieges out in the field. And um, they declare into Lorien. So, you know. The Fellowship was really doing fine. Getting rid of Born with Sorrow and Toil, yeah, it's good, but it you sort of just gave up a movement. You were in Parth Celebrant, and you just effectively moved backwards to Lorien to get rid of Worn with Sorrow and Toil. Is it really that important of a card, given how things are going? Like Bilbo's Song, yeah, it's good, but... Okay, so I allocate one roll three more still no characters and my opponent gets two movement they start by moving i i hit them with an eye get revealed okay so i'm gonna wait for them to um hide and then i'm gonna play foul thing from the deep i'm assuming so that um I can potentially reveal them, potentially get rid of Strider. We'll, we'll see what happens. All right, so I use my uh, mustering of the voice again because I still haven't played Rage of the Dunlundings, so maybe I'm going to use that Palantir for Rage of the Dunlundings. We'll see. They hide, and then I decide, I guess I decide here that the threat of the Fellowship is just not that high, I can save Foul Thing from the Deep until later, and I really want to get going on this siege. These units that I moved into Moria have not really served me well. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't have more regulars to muster up. I'm going to get two automatically from Rage of Dunlandings, and so mustering more regulars wouldn't wouldn't really help here so i think this is sort of a consequence of sitting these four regulars in moria particularly with rage of the dunlandings it i think that ended up being a mistake because if those four units had been in north um dunland just now instead of mustering into mustering i could have just teleported them all into gap of rohan so i guess that's a good lesson if you have rage of the dunlandings let four units sit in North Dunland. That's great. You can teleport them wherever you need to teleport them later. I could have teleported them into Moria with uh, Rage of the Dunlandings. I could teleport them down to Gap of Rohan so, or Cardalon, you know, wherever I want to go. So it seemed like maybe it was better to move them to um, Moria, but it's actually much less mobile by moving them into Moria. Okay, that's a good Rage of the Dunlandings lesson. Powerful card, tricky to use, exactly right. Particularly with a relatively small mustering pool of Isengard. I mean, it's not that small, but you have to be a little careful about how you're spending your regulars. Okay, Fellowship moves a second time. Get another reveal here. I'm happy to, very happy to be seeing reveals and eyes being drawn. That's going to make the foul thing that much more effective. I get my armies going, and uh, I am prepared once and for all to take Helm's Deep, I get ready in Helm's Deep. And 
I guess I move, I'm debating what to do about Woodland Realm here. I want to have enough units to take out Erebor. I also want to be able to defend Woodland Realm if these units come in uh, to Old Forest Road and then besiege Woodland Realm at the start of next round. I think I ended up deciding in the end not to do that. I debated a bunch about exactly what to do because I was worried about army movement at the end of my opponent's turn and then um, Woodland Realm. But I, th I think I decided, you know what, this this army is good enough to be able to defend Woodland Realm. I can move in later if I need to. Um, and I move into Minus Morgul to get ready to take Gondor because I feel like I can get some victory points from Gondor. These units can, the units in West Herondor can move into Dual Amroth when the time is right. And the units from Minus Morgul can come out and take Osgiliath and backfill into Pilargir or put Minas Tirith under siege. So my opponent still has not gotten Gondor to war. Oh, the other thing to think about is the Mouth of Sauron. So when your opponent, uh, when free people has all five nations at war, you can bring in the Mouth of Sauron even if the Fellowship hasn't made it to Mordor. So with a single attack in Erebor and a single attack in Gondor, I can get the Mouth of Sauron one or two turns early, which can really accelerate my, my end game. All right. So at this point, in terms of final um, victory points, I'm thinking, you know, I want to hold on to these three up here for sure. That's three. I definitely want to take Helm's Deep. That's five. I want to go take Dol Amroth and Pilar Gear. That's eight. And then my last two victory points, I don't know, maybe Minas Tirith. That's certainly quite a few armies there. Um, maybe Erebor. I'm a little worried about this army in Carrick. Uh, I can't, I can't leave Woodland Realm too undefended, but Erebor would be nice. I'm a little worried about Dane Ironfoot's guard also, but I do have a bunch of leadership up here and with half orcs and goblin men, plus maybe another mustering card, um, you know, plus some good combat cards, I could end up taking Erebor for the win at the end of the game. Okay. Let's see what happens. So my opponent plays the Red Arrow, um, obviously good to get even more mustering in Rohan, and I attack into Helm's Deep. So um, I do, it looks like I do one. Yeah, I do one, my opponent does two, and then I press and manage to defeat them. Okay, so Rohan fought well, and it's still not completely conquered yet. But I also feel relieved that my opponent hasn't mustered that much into Rohan yet. This army in Helm's Deep should still be enough to take out Rohan. I don't want to leave Rohan unoccupied. Okay, I drew Ulag High, so I have Ulag High, so I have even more um, in the field recruiting. So I'm feeling better about the possibility of going into Erebor, knowing that I can reinforce Woodland Realm with Ulukai or Half Orcs and Goblin Men if I need to. Um, and I need to make sure that I keep at least one elite in the pool for Isengard so I can I can use that uh, Half Orcs and Goblin Men effectively. Okay, so what do you discard here? This is a little tricky. I have Ulukai, Half Orcs and Goblin Men. Those are two reinforcement cards. I have two red tiles. I have Pits of Mordor, Day Without Dawn, and Foul Thing from the Deep. So you can think for a moment what you would discard. My decision was a red tile. So I'm normally very reluctant to discard red tiles. They're a powerful way of slowing down the fellowship and possibly buying you an extra turn. But my thinking is it's quite unlikely that my opponent's going to make it into Mordor this round. So I probably have at least two rounds from that, plus probably two rounds in Mordor. So probably three rounds total to be able to get my victory points. Let's just focus on that. So that's why I decided to get rid of that red tile. I'm very happy with these reinforcement cards. And Day Without Dawn could potentially really slow them down because if they roll two rolls of the West, um, I can get rid of one, make sure they don't make it into Mordor this round. So that's my that's my thinking. All right, so I allocate one eye, I get a roll, and my opponent gets a roll. So this is definitely a possibility now for my opponent to get into Mordor when I thought it was relatively unlikely, but I should still I should still be probably okay. All right, so my opponent starts with a Will of the West, obviously a good choice there to avoid Day Without Dawn, 
and is safe on the movement, that's fair. And then I immediately do character movement here because I want to put that extra Nazgul on the fellowship. It just, um, with the extra uh, die, with a single extra die, my chances of finding the fellowship just really go up quite a lot, not only for this movement, but for the second movement or third movement or fourth movement this round. Okay, so the other thing that I'm going to plan on doing is play Foul Thing from the Deep to be able to increase the chances of revealing them, and that'll slow them down too. All right, so my opponent moves again, the Nazgul does its job, and I get a zero reveal. So that's obviously a good thing. I attack into Pilar gear because this is exactly the moment that you're waiting for a shadow where your opponent didn't roll musters, and you can get the target under siege. So even though um, Gondor was one away from war and there would have been two actions of mustering that that um, free people could have done, this is the moment because they didn't roll musters. Maybe they can use this character, uh, this Palantir to play a reinforcement, either Imrahil or Dol Amroth or Círdan's ships. But then I know if they do that, they're not, they're not getting into Mordor this round. So this this is sort of what you're looking for, a shadow. And also it's free. This is why you kind of want to muster into Gondor earlier, get it prepared so that you, you're not under threat of things like this. Okay, so I attack into Pilar gear. Um, that's successful battle. Gondor's at war now. They used a character die to hide. So that that is a clue to me as shadow that they're probably not planning on making it into Mordor this round because they otherwise could have used Strider's ability to hide with the Palantir. And this way, if they're making it into Mordor now, they're giving me a ring, which if that was your plan anyway, why, why give the ring away? So I'm feeling very happy about that. I'd rather the extra turn, even if it means a slightly harder battle in Dol Amroth. I have additional reinforcements, half orcs and goblin men in Uluk High, and this is a big enough army that it can probably take out um, it can probably take out Dol Amroth even even with two extra elites. Um, especially with my with my combat cards, I think I have some chances. Okay, so I continue um, the harassment of the fellowship because I want, you know, this is a good chance of catching them and if they do make it in i want to make sure they're revealed just just to keep them as slow as possible maybe that was a waste right there um but it is an extra reroll that's pretty significant the other option i could have done instead of moving nazgul i could have played foul thing from the deep and maybe that would have been the better play um that also would have slowed them down i don't know i don't know it's not it's not exactly clear to me what what I should be doing there. I like the extra reroll, 25% extra chance of getting a hit. One, yeah, I, th I think it's probably worth it, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe that was actually too much harassing of the fellowship. Okay. I think the first one was definitely worth it because I needed to get a reveal, but maybe that second one wasn't. Okay, I attack into Dol Amroth. My opponent now plays Cured in Ships, and I breathe a sigh of relief, actually, because... I'm happy to fight Kyrdan. I'm not happy for the Fellowship to get into Mordor this round. Okay. Um, I attack into Dol Amroth, and at this point I play my Desperate Battle because it seems like my opponent is just not too focused on uh, getting a military victory, and if they do try and get a military victory, then I can get my military victory just as fast, So, and I win the tie. So here we go. I play Desperate Battle. We do some damage to each other. I retreat, but... In the end, oh, and I redrew into Mumakil, so I get to play Mumakil here, and um, I'm able to take out Dol Amroth in a single action. Still have five units left, so that was a good that was a good combat result. But I did have pretty good, pretty good cards. Um, okay, I now use these Palantirs to reinforce Erebor, so I'm thinking that's going to be my ten victory points. I'm going to get prepared for it, and. Um, my opponent moves, I miss, and I'm ready to win next round. It's going to be pretty tricky for my opponent to take enough victory points away from me, 
Assuming I get Erebor, and I am still afraid of Dane Ironfoot's guard, but assuming I get Erebor, that puts me at 10. I should be able to keep Pelargir. Maybe they'll retake Dale, but then I can retake Edoras. So that's my plan. They're going to have to go after Woodland Realm. Hopefully I can either get a Elite into uh, Woodland Realm before this army comes crashing in on it. Maybe not. Maybe I'll end up losing Woodland Realm. That obviously would not be not be great to lose Woodland Realm. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay, so um, I drew Shadow Lengthens. Obviously, I'm very happy to see that card. It's a powerful combat effect. I have Elephants up here in Erebor, and um, I want to be able to reinforce Woodland Realm if needed. So that's that's a great card for me. My opponent properly declares, and they're going to be able to get in. This Nazgul search is not going to be useful against them, but that's okay. I feel happy having discarded red cards. I really just want to keep it all possible. I roll two eyes. Not great, but it's not great. My opponent gets basically, it looks like three. If they're going to move once with the fellowship, that gives them one attack, one movement, and uh, one extra attack with a ring. So they can just make it to Woodland Realm, but they cannot make it to Erebor. So... So that's good that this this giant army cannot make it to Erebor. So what that means is I can sort of whittle down Erebor as low as I need to and then use the Shadow Lengthens to get into Woodland Realm to defeat it. So my plan is to try and get Erebor done and then retreat, get any extra units into Woodland Realm as soon as possible. All right. My opponent starts by moving the Fellowship right away. Um, normally, that would not be a good plan because um, I would then be able to play Nazgul Search um, or Cruel Weather or anything like that. But I have no rings, and I actually rolled no Palantirs and no character dice. So my opponent actually knows they're completely safe from any effects against the Fellowship as long as they don't give me a ring. So that's good. Good reason to keep a ring for Shadow. That said... In terms of tempo, I still think you want to get this army from Carrick into Woodland Realm as soon as possible so that I don't have time to defeat Erebor and come back and reinforce Woodland Realm. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is how many attacks do I have and how many attacks do I need? So I'm going to need to take out Erebor, ideally as quickly as possible. Let's, let's count that. All right, so I get a hit. That's lucky. I draw three. Boromir goes away. Pro that's that's fine. Not going to be, be that big of a deal. All right, so now let's count my attacks. I need one attack against Erebor. That leaves me with one, two, three attacks left. I need one, maybe, to come back to Dale. I need potentially two movements to get <clears throat> to Pelargir. And or two attacks to get to Edoras. So my thinking is it would be great if I can get Erebor this action, then I can second action move to Dale. And maybe my opponent will at that point be besieging Woodland Realm, but I can attack back in from, from the army in Dale and completely decimate that army, leave them with nothing left, um, just to give Woodland Realm the best chance possible for surviving. And then if my opponent takes Dale, that's fine. I can, I'll still have enough actions to go take Edoras. The thing to realize is that these two musters, they look like they aren't an attack, but in combination with the Mouth of Sauron, assuming the dwarves are at war, then this is actually an extra attack. So I actually have four attacks even without any rings, and that's going to be significant. Okay, so I attack Erebor. That puts the dwarves at war. I do my best to take them out, and I, I end up using Mumakil here. Maybe that's a mistake. Maybe that's a mistake because it does prevent me from, um, even if I win this, from reinforcing Woodland Realm immediately with one action. But my thinking is it's more important to win this siege. I have to win this siege first. That's my top priority. And then defending Woodland Realm for regulars is not horrible. Um, particularly if I have some extra units from Dale to throw throw at the army. Okay, so um, 
we get some hits. That was a pretty good attack. And then I press all the way and um, manage to defeat. I play Day Without Dawn there as a combat effect because my opponent doesn't have any Wills of the West and my other battles are going to be more defensive. So that's why I do it there. Probably should have done it a little sooner, but it's good enough. All right, so I'm at 10 victory points. My opponent has four dice left. My opponent has four dice left to figure out how to take back at least probably two victory points. One isn't going to be enough because I can also take address. All right, so my opponent passes there, and I'm really happy to see that because it means that I can get these units into Dale, and um, that means I'm going to be able to get at least one more regular into Woodland Realm before my opponent shows up. All right. My opponent then draws a card. We get Ents, that's nice. And I proceed with my plan to get a bunch of units into Pilar Gear. Now that was nice because it didn't require an attack and it lets me get extra units into um, Woodland Realm. And now I have four leadership in there. That's gonna be super hard. Okay, my opponent plays Ents, great. Ents, more Ents, great. And then um, I lose uh, Saruman, obviously I'm a little sad about that, but okay. And then we prove the Swifter. And this is super cool because it lets Gandalf get all the way up here to Carrick. And now this is actually potentially um, a real problem for me because now they can actually get to, Ero to Erebor with through a day and a night, which I had not seen. So maybe this is a... Um, misplay on my part but with through a day and a night my opponent can get to withered heath with this army muster they can use a character die to attack into erebor and then a ring to attack erebor with this giant force which would easily take it and so that's really not great for me also all these nazgul now are doing nothing so this is this is a great play i still wonder maybe it's worth it to do it sooner one other thought is, yeah, no, I think that's it. I think that's a great, that's a great play. It would have been, would have been really cool if they also had through a day and a night, but still, even this, you're going to get, you're going to have some chances against Woodland Realm. I still wonder if you could have done it sooner, sooner in the turn, a little faster. Okay. At this point, um, I attack into, um, West of Net and, it looks like I don't have any more attacks left, and therefore my opponent only needs to take Dale, which would be a very easy, you know, much easier attack because uh, you wouldn't have to keep pressing. Uh, you wouldn't have to keep reducing elites to press. But um, I think they forgot that I had the Mouth of Sauron available to me now. So this is the moment I'm bringing in Mouth of Sauron. The Fellowship isn't at war, isn't uh, in Mordor yet, but all the factions are at war. So um, I bring in the Mouth of Sauron, and now this final muster, even without a ring, is going to let me attack into Edoras, which means that my opponent must take Woodland Realm and must use a ring to do so. All right, so they put them under siege. Um, I go ahead and attack into Edoras. Obviously, that works. And um, they end up retreating after round one, which I think makes sense. Why prolong it? And then use a ring. And we have some debate about charge here, about whether it hits on fives or sixes. But it's just a normal um, unmodified attack. So because you're charging into a siege, it only hits on a six not on a five and a six. Normally when the free people play charge, they're going to hit on a five or six because normally their combat, unmodified combat rule is, is on five. But when you're attacking into a siege, your unmodified combat rule is a six and therefore charge only hits on a six. So one hit, still good, but you know, uh, not as good as three hits. Three hits would have been great. Uh, they end up getting one hit. I get a few hits. They have to press to continue. Gandalf is obviously working. Um, and, uh, end up not being able to, not being able to take it. So that's the end of the game. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Sorry, this was a little bit of a long video, but there are actually quite a few things to explore here. 
and I will probably not be doing very many videos, but it is um, going to the, the tournament, the annual tournament is going to be starting in January, uh, just in a, a little more than a little more than two months relatively soon. And uh, if you haven't heard about it yet, I'll be posting links about it. I'll be announcing it more. Please uh, come and play. It's a very friendly tournament. It's a competitive tournament, but it's also everybody's friendly and excited to play in it. So please come join if you can uh, and look forward to more about that in the future. And I'll be doing videos on my tournament games when that comes up. Thanks so much.